Lots of room in the middle. Who wants to squeeze in? Anyone? My only announcement is please come join us at the inn immediately following the reading for kegs of beer and lawn games. And dinner will be at the usual time tonight, maybe a little early. Um, so if you'd rather take a nap, that's fine. And you can meet us for dinner. And Wyatt has an announcement. You have to play the games to get the beer? You... <laughs> And you get more beer if you play better. <laughs> I just got something in the mail and I want to tell you all about it. Uh, Richard Bausch has a brand new novel. He's here all the time. He's not here this summer. Before, during, after, Knopf. I tried to get it. I tried different ways. We can only get it in our bookstore on August 12. So go to your bookstores wherever you are and get it there. Meanwhile, we've got uh, three of his books on hand, Someone to Watch Over Me, Stories of Richard Bausch, and The Selected Stories. So, remember our friend, uh, as uh, he would remember you, all right? <laughs> and now, please welcome the very well-composed Adrian Heron. Thank you. Um, when my, my son was three, my Aunt Peg came to visit us from Philadelphia, and she was immediately appalled because, well, he wasn't quite three, but we'd never taken him to church or taught him any prayers. So she immediately set out to rectify this by making friends with an elderly couple at Mass who lived across the street from us, and by teaching them just a simple gratitude prayer. So, you know, it started out with, thank you for my mother and father, thank you for my house. Um, Peter caught on to this really quickly and adored it, and it, it escalated um, to, thank you for the wood stove, thank you for the dog's bone, thank you for my shoes, thank you for this potato chip, thank you, but it, it, would all, it was always, thank you, God. So it was like, thank you, God, for the wood stove. Thank you, God, for the potato chip. Um, and till finally, uh, to my aunt's horror, just as the elderly neighbors were walking by, he flung up in the front door and said, thank you, God, for daddy's beer and mommy's wine. Um, <laughs> so I kind of want to play Peter here a little bit um, and start by thanking Wyatt for the, the invitation to this extraordinary place this year, this community, which you are all a part of, and I'm so grateful for you all. Um, I'd also like to thank the, the extremely talented staff, um, Megan and, and Adam especially, and, um, and Gail Hockman is here, so I, I want to thank her in person. And whoops, here I go again, thank you God. Um, and I cannot be in a room with Margot Livesey without um, saying thank you Margot. Margot started everything for me, so thank you Margot. Um, and thank you all. Um, I'm going to read from this novel, A Man Came Out of a Door in the Mountain. Um, it's set in northern British Columbia, and I need to give you just a little bit of background for it. Uh, there is a highway that runs across northern British Columbia, Highway 16, and it runs all the way from Prince Rupert to Alberta. But the section between Prince Rupert and Prince George um, is also called the Highway of Tears. And it's called that because over uh, the past four decades at least, a great many women and girls have gone missing and or been found murdered on that highway. Um, and for, until very, very recently, those murders have gone unsolved and largely uninvestigated. Um, many people believe because the victims were um, Aboriginal, Indigenous women. Um, so I, I wanted to write about this. Um, and I, I've never had that desire to write about anything like in current events, but I couldn't let this one go. But I didn't want to uh, co-opt a real family's tragedy, um, and I'm no kind of a journalist, so I didn't know how to do it. I was driving up on Highway 16, um, a place where people said, you can't drive alone, you can't drive alone, you look like an Indian. Um, and, and so I wasn't, I wasn't driving alone, I was driving with some people. And when you drive down Highway 16, it's a sobering experience because it's, it's absolutely gorgeous. It's the most beautiful place. Um, but every so often you come across a yellow billboard that says, women beware, killer on the loose, do not hitchhike. And then there's some photos of the missing. Um, 
And, you know, just musing about the nature of evil, where does evil come from? And this idiotic phrase came into my head, maybe it just comes out of a door in the mountain, um, which was totally useless to me. In, until I was home um, pulling mint, if any of you have ever planted mint in the garden, you know that your yearly thing is to, to pull it out again. Um, so I was doing that and I remembered a story that my Irish grandmother had told me about, a man that came down from the hills in Donegal, um, and he came on a day when it was a big payday, like the horse races or something, and he would set the men to gambling and cause great destruction. Um, whole households would be lost, livelihoods would be lost. And before he left, he would raise his hand and touch the lintel of the door. And my grandmother used to say, no matter how many times they built a house on that property, whenever that house came back up, the mark would be there. Because he was the devil, of course. Um, and when I remembered that phrase, it stopped being, maybe it comes out of a door in the mountain, and maybe it became, he comes out of a door in the mountain. And that gave me kind of an end to the novel. So the novel's about, it's really not, exactly about the Highway of Tears, the disappearances or murders. It's about five friends um, who, uh, over the course of a few summer days, and some strangers who come to town, and some local hoodlums, one of which you'll meet during this, these excerpts. Um, and scattered throughout are also sort of a shadow narrative, these little tales about the devil that are told um, by Leo, who's one of the main narrators, narrators by his uncle Lud to Leo. And I'm going to read you a, just a couple of those so you can hear what they sound like, and then I'm going to read you a chapter from the novel. It won't take forever. These all have titles. This one is called Devils Make the Best Salesmen. A man appeared in Uncle Lud's town the year he started secondary. A man who went door to door with a suitcase. He wore a skinny tie and a shiny suit. What he was selling was hidden, locked within the case. I'd love to show you if you have a minute, he told the woman of the house. Children clustered around her. First, might I have a glass of water? The road up to the house was dusty, he added, so very dry. While one of the kids went to fetch the water, the rest noticed how the man's shoes sparkled and they nudged one another. The fellow's hands were smooth and unmarked. They couldn't tear their eyes away as he unbuckled straps, unsnapped locks, and opened his world for them. Sweets, that's what he was selling. Only one flavor, an astonishment. His suitcase crammed full of gold-wrapped candies that, unfurled, made them all take a step backward. On the corner of the porch, a hound on a chain growled, not so much in response to the visitor, but to the reactions of his family. Madam, the salesman said, might I offer you a complimentary sample of, of my wares? How could she say no? The sweet was blood red, varnished, and salty on the surface. The housewife half choked when it hit her tongue. My fault, mister, she apologized. I was expecting something else, cinnamon, a, a, a spice of some kind. Her tongue dried from the salt, even as the sweet beneath it beckoned and her hand reached involuntarily for another. The salesman held back, eyeing the children, who'd inched behind their mother, clutching her skirts, hiding their faces from his temptation. Did you dream this, I wanted to know? A story is not a dream, Uncle Ludd told me. He went on to describe how a dream is a fractured shadow, a cardboard village. A story, though, Uncle Ludd said. Now a story has solid form. You can hang your hat on a story. The devil doesn't care about character development that hidden code for moral expansion. The buds and branches of careworn emotional depth are anathema to him. He favors regression, backsliding, the wave-on-wave -wave corruption, the dissolution, if you will, of character. Don't ask for character here. Eventually, if, that very, if not that very day, the candy salesman would find the children at the doorway receptive. And they would be struck by how once on the tongue the sweet seemed to ripple as if riding an unseen current before dissolving with an audible whoosh, a tiny explosion that nothing could replicate, although quite a few children would discover as they grew older how closely the physical effect of that sugar rock resembled a popular homemade drug. The only difference being the candy's effect ended with that marvelous eruption, while the drug's explosion dug craters within them that could never be healed and they would do anything to get more. It's only candy, the salesman said. Surely you've tasted it before. And this is another one called um, Laundry Day for the Devil. There was once a woman who had 12 daughters. 
The girls ranged in age from 6 to 36, and of course they weren't related by blood. That wasn't the way they counted sisters in this family. Only one of the middle sisters, a girl of 17, could look forward and backward and relate her family's history with any clarity. Her mother had given birth to three girls and then taken in her crazy cousin's two daughters and a pregnant girl who'd been at school with the eldest. More girls were born. Years later, the girl who'd been the baby of that daughter's school friend came to live with the family too, and a few more girl cousins moved in for a while. The middle girl herself went once to live with a relative and claimed a couple more sisters that way. Oh yeah, try and keep track. Over the years, the sisters multiplied and divided. They reconfigured themselves into new extended families, then looped back into this one, often holding the hand of yet another sister. Through tragedies and joys, they kept track of one another, and even the thieves among them were never denied a home to steal from. One sister died in a truck accident, another drank herself to death, one hitched to Idaho and married a fellow who started a church. That was a birth sister, St. Audrey. Of the others, one was in jail, but it wasn't her fault at all. A debt she'd claimed for another had led her there. One sister was a nurse, the kind who came to your house and gave examinations. A success was the near eldest, a pretty heavy-browed artist who taught at a university but had no luck with men. A family of tough, big-hearted women who looked out for one another, all of them loving fiercely, no matter where they traveled or who they almost killed or married. Enough of them returned to stay or returned or stayed to keep the house full and crazy and close, real close. Throughout it all, the mother cared for them. Across a wide backyard, she strung a clothesline long enough to hang 12 dresses, 12 empty dresses hanging limply or flapping madly, 12 skirts tucked tight or flitting inside out, each laundry day, the woman pinned up the clothes and gathered them hours later smelling of hay in the thin, piney northern sun. The filled basket of her feet might have been heavy with gold. The woman prized it so much. No one else could touch it. But one day, Uncle Ludd says, a woman went to the, li the woman went to the line with her empty basket to find a man in a suit leaning against the far pole. Can I help you, mister? The woman called out, clutching her empty basket. Are you lost? I may be, ma'am, he said, bowing his head to light a cigarette. I surely may be. Keeping distance between them, the woman pointed and waved and tried every which way to send the fellow toward town, short of striding toward him and pushing him. And he did soon leave her, but first he must help, he declared as thanks for setting him on the clear path. With almost physical pain, the woman watched the fellow unpin the dresses on the far side. He moved so quickly, her outstretched hand couldn't touch a one, and soon he was right beside her, dresses looped over one arm. He laid them across her basket, and when she bowed her head to bundle them inside, the fellow loped away, past the kitchen garden, out of sight around a corner of the house. She did not hear a car engine start up, and she hurried indoors where daughters were cooking, daughters were gabbing, daughters were fussing on outfits to go to town. For the first time in memory, she latched the door behind her. Only then did the mother untangle her laundry, dress by dress, to find each bearing a tiny stain, a constellation of cigarette burns or an irreparable tear. One dress was missing altogether, a sister's stolen dress, a stolen sister's dress. So that's just a taste of those. And then this is um, kind of a cobbled together bit of a chapter here that's called collateral damage. Um, is this okay? Okay. Um, and I, I should warn those of you with more delicate sensibilities than my own um, that there is some language in here. I always wear a little bit of pearls or something to kind of offset the vulgarity. Um, uh, so collateral damage. Yes, an ordinary summer's night, a Tuesday like any other. A dry tempest, the mountains glowing beneath a bruised, turbid sky. An occasional truck screaming up Fuller Road onto the highway. The distant sound of bottles hitting pavement. And echoing outward the too familiar siren of monotonous, perfunctory screams. Rising complaints joining the chorus. Somebody shut that kid the hell up. Even Tessa, quiet, superstitious Tessa, wouldn't escape the devil's wanderings this time. For her, the night began when her eight-year-old nephew Bryce fell into one of his fits. 
Tessa says the kid's got a real medical condition caused by her own sister, who spent most of that pregnancy so drunk she didn't even notice her labor pains until her feet were knocked out from under her, and she lay flat against the wall in a growing puddle as if tossed there by one of her boyfriends, which in a way she had been. Bryce was born within minutes and really has never stopped hollering, reminding everyone that he's a wronged child. He's a big kid for his age, almost aggressively affectionate when he's not crashing down the walls, and Tessa wears bruises as much from his attempts to have her hug and cuddle him as from his rampages. That night, he took issue with her when she tried to get him to bed and aimed a steel-tipped boot that nailed her face hard, missing her eye but opening her left cheek so that she had to wake up the grandfather to keep a still-roaring Bryce from killing the other kids and then call her sister at the bar where she worked for a ride up to the clinic. Her sister groused but showed up 15 minutes later shaking her head as Tessa, her head spinning, crawled into the tattered back seat and her sister gunned and swerved towards the health center. I've told you, her sister said. Just smack him when he gets bad. Smack him and drag him out to the shed. Get that old padlock out. You remember how they did it. Tessa didn't have the energy to argue with her sister, nor must much chance. Her sister dropped her at the health center's emergency entrance, but no way would she stay with her. I'd like to, but people are waiting, you know. Her sister didn't even get out of the car. She lit a new cigarette as Tessa fumbled her way, barely managing to close the door behind her. That's okay, her sister shouted as she leaned over to slam the door properly. And Tessa staggered up the ramp and into the clinic to take her place beside the steadily growing clientele of the maimed and bruised, the punctured young men emerging from the bad end of bar fights. A lethargic woman at the desk passed her a slim pad of gauze lo loosely packed with another thin wad of some kind of frozen gel and an actual piece of ice, and she pressed it over her swelling cheek and waited and waited and waited. Across the room, Marcus Nagel, a bone jutting out of his own arm, dozed fitfully, slumped in one chair, his long legs stre stretched across the aisle. He was stoned, he was drunk, he was still stoned, still drunk. As far as he knew, he'd been wrecked for the previous five days, had worked hard to get into that state, and would have liked to remain there, but the night had nattered on too long. His wallet had unaccountably slimmed and then fattened. He'd almost certainly indulged in a goddamn fight he barely remembered, and now he was feeling the corners of his drunkenness slip away against the waiting room's bright, flat lights. He could feel the fall into sobriety rushing toward him, and it pissed him off, so that even as he managed a few unconscious moments he grumbled, and when his eyes did open, they were full of disdain. He hated this waiting room, which he knew too well, which was always, depending upon his condition, chill-inducing or hot as hell, which was designed for another level of torture, as if to illustrate for you, you stupid dick, that due to your complete lack of judgment, your unfailing bad luck, not only had you incurred a peculiar searing pain, an injury that promised the loss of work and yet more public humiliation, you had also somehow invited the hospital staff to join in and ramp that experience up. Welcome, the place seemed to stay. Let's screw with you a little more. The chairs, uncomfortably hard, were interconnected by long metal bars behind the seat backs so that you couldn't move them around and say, get an extra foot away from some weeping monstrosity whose head you might have plowed in a mere half hour earlier. They crammed you in here, and although the health center itself wasn't that big, the waiting room had been positioned so that you couldn't see into the reception station. So unless an aide dashed by to park another gurney in the queue or to motion someone out of the room, you had nothing to gauge your own progress. The magazines were crappy, too. Ripped and stained celebrity digest with mustaches and swear words and well-endowed body parts scribbled over the pretty people. And pristine golf worlds. Who the fuck looked at golf world around here? <laughs> The place stunk of bleach, which from Marcus's experience was a surefire sign of cover-up. One nurse stalked up and down the corridor outside the waiting room, seemingly doing little more than reading a clipboard. Marcus despised her and probably told her so every time she clattered past the door in her white clogs. But of all the health center's nasty tricks, the long wobbling strips of fluorescent lights enraged Marcus the most. He had once been escorted directly from the examining room to the holding center for shooting out the entire row above him, sending glass and sparks hailing over the room. He'd, he'd been shaking bits of glass from his hair for hours, his scalp stinging continually, but he'd been too satisfied to care. He liked to imagine that grand flash of blue light bursting out of the waiting room and engulfing the reception desk and the fat white girl planted there. 
and for weeks he'd felt a singular sense of heroism, as if he'd saved other vanquished souls from that at least. He was pissed to realize they'd replaced the light fixture since the last time he'd been in here, making not a single improvement in the process. Now one long bulb spasmed above, making him downright nauseous. He was tempted to start anew, but he couldn't raise his arm. And so it was with particular pleasure that he watched Tessa set down the ice pack she'd been pressing against her cheek to pivot onto the highest edges of her paralyzed chair and use the corner of her bloody shirt sleeve to unscrew the hot light bulb and give them all ease. He would have applauded if he could have. His relief at the absence of that pulsing light was so great. After that, he could not take his eyes off the corner where Tessa slumped. Her head tilted into the hand holding the gel pack, her eyes closed, the dead gray fluorescent tube beside her. She seemed to Marcus a kind of heroine in disguise, and he marveled again at how slight as she was. She scrambled up onto that chair in her little red sneakers and bounced so neatly. The sight of her relieved a pressure in his heart he hadn't realized he felt before. She cleared his vision. With a gallantry so common among the continuously drunk, he resolved to do his own good deed before every last bit of his edge vanished, and he felt too crappy to care about anyone but himself. Hey, he bellowed. Hey, you there. Hey, nurse. In his experience, nonstop caterwauling always got attention, and he wasn't wrong here. When the clinic nurse finally rushed to shush him, her breath caught at the newly dimmed room, and even in those shadows, she recognized Marcus. You she said, shaking her head. But he would not shut up. We need help here, he hollered, resisting an impulse to punch the chair the nurse stood beside. Across the room, a woman began to wail, and another bar fight survivor held his head in his hands and cursed them all. Shut, shut, shut the hell up. The nurse could see the direction in which Marcus was propelling the room, and she knew the two big aides she could count on to break up any brawls were out in the aid car, so she sighed and went to help Marcus to his feet. To her shock, he pushed her away, pointing instead to little Tessa, now curled into the well of her chair, her hair wet and matted on one side from the melting ice that had been slipped into the gel pack. One foot, the unlaced sneaker half off, hung over the chair's edge, and Marcus saw now that someone had written all over her sneakers with a broad black pen. Somehow this made him even more insistent, even though Tessa hadn't even raised her head to acknowledge this latest brouhaha. Her, Marcus commanded, her, now. But your arm, the nurse began, gesturing towards the visible bone, which she hadn't given a rat's ass about before. Her, Marcus repeated. The clinic nurse could barely get Tessa to her feet. Together they staggered toward an examination room. Her stunt on the chair had fully depleted Tessa, and she struggled to stay upright. Her head drooped as she was maneuvered from the room so that she never noticed Marcus's satisfied grin. He might have been a little disappointed at her lack of reaction, but he didn't show it. Instead, he crowed to the rest of the waiting room, all those busted stone-dead faces, crowed in the last full glory of his ebbing drunkenness. And later, as he crawled into his own examination room, right before the doctor pressed on the bone and he passed out, he caught a glimpse of Tessa, her face a bruised mash, and heard the aide beside her say, that one, that was the fellow. And later yet, with Mar when Marcus, with his arm set in a new cast and a decent handful of painkillers in his pocket, pushed himself back down the corridor and into the cool relief of near dawn, he thought he might be dreaming when she slipped off the concrete wall where she must have been waiting for him. You need a ride, his muddled tongue managed. My sister's coming, she said, taking a few steps away from him. I don't see her, he said. The van he'd found had gone away. He remembered vaguely handing over the keys, not to his brother, another fellow, a friend, he guessed. His brother wasn't waiting, of course, but that was no problem. Car's right here, he said to Tessa. In fact, the lot was half full. Excuse me. In the old days, they would have had their pick. He succeeded in nodding once towards the backlit parking lot before something broke adrift inside his head. How can you drive with a broken arm, she asked. Practice, he thought, a whole lot of practice. The words chugged but never fully emerged. His eyes would barely open, and his left hand scrambled weakly in his pocket. His fingers briefly met and caressed a wad of bills, money he'd sworn to his brother he would deliver, before they found the slim metal rod, his near favorite and most handy tool. 
From her perch by the hospital entrance, Tessa swiveled in place to follow his struggles he crossed the lot and paused finally beside what must have been the oldest car there, an ancient Toyota parked directly under the sole light. A slow wave was surging through him. No, one wave after another. Not pain, not the pleasant discomfort of drunkenness either, some other unknown elemental disturbance that had been dispensed with the pain med. As a very young boy, Marcus had spent a summer's week on a fishing boat, and he'd never forgotten the glimpse he'd had of a sailing yacht cruising at high speed past the battered and stalled gill netter his father pretended was their vacation. Now a couple of quick moves, the ignition bypassed and the car was running, Marcus felt elated, redeemed, as if a separate being, one as beautiful as that glorious sloop, was sailing through his veins, ghosting on an orphaned wind all of his own making. A disconnection, he felt himself slipping and soaring. You can't drive. The girl's words tippled beside him. How had they got to the ground? Bits of gravel clung to his palms. Just wait, okay? My sister. Your sister's not coming, baby. My brother's not coming. Nobody comes for us, do they, baby? Did he say all that? He didn't know. He didn't know. He danced with her through air, through a tepid surge of water, through the open passenger door of his newly purloined Toyota. She eased his legs inside, set him right or nearly so. She tucked the wad of bills he hadn't known he dropped back into his pocket. He leaned his head back against the car seat and began to cry, a slurping, huffing bout that even drunk should have humiliated Marcus, but instead comforted him. What a weeper he was. What a grand and wonderful weeper. A tentative hand reached around his shoulder and he leaned into Tessa, feeling the rough edge of her own bandage press against his tears. He was shivering too in a bad way. Where, Tessa said, where do you want to go? Marcus suddenly remembered a white strip of sidewalk another night with another companion and before he quite realized it, he'd become a ventriloquist. The peak and pine, he said, his stolen voice tinny and assured, sounds just fine. Somehow Marcus managed to crack the window and air whistled beside his raised pursed lips as if the night itself was astonished to see the pair of them traveling together, that soul-damaged man and the battered girl who could not leave even a hoodlum in distress. Tessa did not own a car and drove her sister's wreck only when she had to on those nights when she was able to spirit away the keys to avert sure disaster. At her best, she was uncertain behind the wheel, endlessly second-guessing distance and speed. And should she ever have to drive, she knew enough to equip herself with a pocket full of good luck charms, an old heads-up penny she'd found unscathed on the railroad tracks, a sprig of dried forget-me-not, a silver fish Leo had won in a grade six bazaar and tucked into her hand before running away as if he were being chased by the staggering frenzy of his own pent-up pigeon-toed desires. She had none of those talismans with her in the clinic parking lot, but she had no choice. The car's engine was running. Marcus was moaning. She could barely bend her hand around the steering wheel. Her legs trembled and her foot jumped on the pedal so that the car's progress was jerky and belabored. As lightning sliced across the hills above town and the brief shock of illumination seemed to crumple and compress the landscape, poor Tessa's heart leapt as painfully as if she'd achieved the crash she feared. She drove even more slowly then, as slowly as she dared. The lightning punctuating every turn bursts of blue light that engulfed the wretched car as if determined to expose and demolish as well. When they reached the PMP, she braked right in front of the office door, leaving Marcus snoring open mouthed while she went inside alone. Albie Portier's night clerk Vincent was also asleep, and Tessa had to go around the empty front desk into the back room where Vincent dozed on a cot, his hands folded across his chest like a corpse. His habit was to stay up a full hour past the last bar's closing time, waiting for potential stragglers before setting his alarm to allow a few hours rest. He'd been awakened in the past by such niceties as beer poured on his face, a jab in the gut, even the blunt side of a knife once edging across his temple. Most of the night's receipts were stuck in a lock, lock drawer under the front desk. He had another thin envelope of actual cash wedged under his ass. He liked to think he'd trained himself to jump to his feet at the slightest tickle in the air. But Tessa shook him again and again, recoiling each time to wipe her good palm on her still shaky legs. And when she finally did rouse him, he gasped and cowered against the back wall. Tessa did look a mess, her little face half engulfed in bandaging. She wanted to finish up here. 
Fellow outside, she told Vincent, in the tough girl voice she'd learned from Jackie, needs a room and some help in. I gotta go. Vincent was suspicious. What fellow, he said. Tessa backed out of the door and Vincent followed her into the tiny reception area. Right there, she pointed, in the car, right in front of the door. You paying? He is. He'll pay you. I saw his money. Not you. And you'll have to help him, too. He just got back from the doctor. He's got a broken arm, I guess. Vincent was coming round now. He recognized Tessa from the high school. You could have at least parked the car. There's no key, she said. He didn't have a key. I can't turn it off. Then Vincent understood. Shit, he said, peering out the glass door towards the slump figure. That's Marcus Nagel, isn't it? Wait, Tessa said, seeing his face closing. She ran back to the car and slipped her hand into Marcus's pocket, removing the bills wrapped in a rubber band. She clumsily peeled off three and tried to stick the rest of the money back, but Marcus rolled and moaned and the bundle would not stick to him, so for the moment she shoved the roll of beers and bills into the front pocket of her own jeans. Here, she said, thrusting the, three th thrusting the three loose bills towards Vincent, who was watching her every move as if reluctant to believe in the money. It was more than the nightly rate. He knew that. She must know that, too. But Tessa didn't say a word when Vincent simply took the cash, put two bills into the locked drawer, and the last into his own private envelope. He grabbed a door card from the box stack and swiped it through a machine two or three times, swearing until a beep sounded. Then he swept out the door in front of Tessa, slid into the driver's seat, and drove the car to the lot's back edge. Once Tessa heard the engine stall and die, she began walking. The PMP was on the far edge of Fuller Street. Not too long a walk home. Fifteen minutes if she walked fast, and she would. The dry lightning that had chased her from the health center had moved onward far back into the hills, and the street ahead was glazed with a darkness that seemed almost fluid. Security lights offered shafts of illumination she'd sooner avoid as she navigated those blocks home. Any other time, she would have run the whole distance, blithe, unstoppable, but whatever they'd given her at the health center had numbed her limbs and left her with a racing heart, and she wasn't sure how far she'd get. One side of her face throbbed. If she could just lie down. She wiggled her hand into her pocket, disconcerted by that wad of paper. If she had the fish, she thought, just Leo's silver fish, she wouldn't, couldn't think about it. She'd just go. She squared her shoulders, shivering a little now in the near dawn air, and had nearly made it past the PMP's parking lot when she realized both her shoes were untied. She shouldn't be cold. At home, they'd all be flinging the sheets off them and peeling off their thin night clothes to find relief from the heat. But she could not stop shivering. The laces would not come together in her hands, and she just managed to grasp them for the third failed try when she glimpsed a movement ahead of her and to the right. For one absurd moment, she thought it might be the help she'd been hoping for. Leo, she whispered, straightening and peering into the dark. She saw him then, a figure only a few feet away, standing clear of the parking lot lights within scrawny pine silt, the scrawny pine seedlings Albi Portier called landscaping. A slim form with a tiny coal in his hand. A cigarette, she guessed, that he was pointing in her direction. Her vision was messed up, the sidewalk ahead had a wave to it, and her heart continued to bump and grind out of control. How tired you look, a man's voice said, clear as could be. His lips might have been right beside her ear. Leaves rustled, a shoe tapped. Tessa caught a glimpse of a shiny swath of hair, metal-colored in the black-and-white coloring of night, a granite face of lines and angles that she believed she recognized but could not place. It might have been a trick combination of his cigarette and the motel sign's light, which could only reach so far, and began petering out here in streaky lines, but she could have sworn a halo of smoke surrounded and obscured the, the figure. She smelled smoke. Beyond the outline of his form, town faded away into pitch. This had the unsettling effect of seeming as if nothing existed beyond him. The wound on her cheek began again to tremble as if calling out. She pressed a palm against her bandage to shush it and sang out with a sudden pain. The face before her reacted as if he too had been struck with that quick stab, that electric jolt. But then he smiled as if the pang translated as pleasure. Behind them, Vincent had managed to extricate Marcus, whose now familiar moan rent the night air. 
A kind of inquisitive bellowing followed as Vincent cursed and tried to hush Marcus. The sound might have just as well have come from her. She felt it strike deep in her belly. And even as the figure before her advanced with eerie certainty, she fled. She ran straight back to the PMP, feeling a damp breath on her neck, the man's smoke pinching her lungs. She ran, flew so fast, she ran right out of one shoe, leaving it among the sh wood chip mulch that bordered the motel's walkway. She arrived at the door Vincent was opening, oh, brilliant embrace of light, the blinding fluorescence, just in time to ease under Marcus's good arm and stagger with, it, with him into what, at that moment, surely must have felt like safety. Yeah, Marcus crooned. Oh, yeah, baby. His eyes would not fully open, but a dumb smile crept onto his face and stayed there even as he drifted away again. Vincent dumped Marcus on the bed, ignoring his new cast, hadn't they all seen worse? That was as far as he planned to go. It was clear. Keep him quiet, will ya, he told Tessa. He'll have to be out of here by 11 tomorrow unless one of you pays for another night, Vincent told her, as if she were in charge. Oh, sure, Tessa thought. Once Vincent scuttled away, she locked the door and put the chain up and after a moment also pulled the single unbolted chair against it. Vincent's remark had reminded her of the money in her pocket and she tried to squirm it back into Marcus's but he'd rolled onto his good side by then and his broken arm covered the other one. She thought about sticking it under his pillow or setting it on the nightstand but what if he didn't see it there? She pushed the money back into her own jeans for the time being. Oh, to go home. She wanted desperately to go home. She tried the phone, imagining she could call her feckless sister, but the line was dead and she couldn't, she couldn't face the man outside again. A charge was still racing through her, but the screaming pain in her cheek was much diminished. The room swooned thick and sour with the day's heat, but she didn't dare crack a window, imagining a familiar wrinkled hand grayed to ash, suddenly clutching the sill from the outside. A fan switch on the wall produced no result. She held her ear against the door and in the brief heart-rending heart -rending interlude before Marcus began to snore, she heard footsteps, oh, the lightest, most assured of taps, passing in the open corridor. Marcus was already insensible to the world. He wasn't going to hurt her tonight. Gazing at his tousled hair, the white gleam of his pale face, that open mouth, uncluttered expression, she felt sure of that. First sign of dawn, she'd get out of there. For now, all she could do was wait. She flicked off every light and curled up as best she could in that, the room's only chair, that vinyl bucket with a long curved crack in the back she'd managed painfully to drag against the door. She was determined to wait out the hour or so to sunrise, but was so exhausted she soon fell into a deep hole of a dream, one that might have carried her well past midday if sometime around eight the next morning a heavy banging had not begun on the door, a violent, boot-kicking frenzy that not only yanked her by the back of the neck from the nightmare ravine she'd fallen into, but also set her flying, a rag doll weight, from the slick vinyl chair against the bed with such force. She continued banging first against the night table, then the wall beyond, until she came to rest, if one could call that broken pose rest, directly beneath the stained bread spread that Marcus and his restless sleep had thrown to the floor. The entire action occupied mere seconds. Whoever engineered the broken door, the soaring chair, apparently missed Tessa's own flight. Neither did anyone notice her landing, and momentarily the fall crushed Tessa. Even so, she had the presence of mind to reach out two fingers and snag the bottom edge of the bedspread and draw it closer as she swiftly rolled beneath the bed that was the only defense between her and whatever new rage had catapulted her to this spot. Hey, asshole, a male voice boomed as the bed springs, bed springs above her bounced inches away from her stiff, sore face. Wake up. Where's the fucking money? Thank you. Mm -hmm.